Speaking of producing, Mr. Schiff uh, seemingly forgot about energy as we are now the number one producer of oil. Joining me, Stuart Glickman, Deputy Research Director, Energy Equity Analyst at CFRA. So, Stuart, how do we capitalize on that when there's all this saber rattling and drama in the Middle East? Does it have to be as disruptive a force when we can just drill and pump? Yeah, good morning, Oliver. So you're right, U.S. is the biggest producer of crude oil on the planet. Uh, however, uh, the amount of um, spare capacity that exists in the world uh, would not make up for any kind of major uh, supply shortage coming out of the Middle East if, for example, Iran were to close the Straits of Hormuz. So I think that the, the buildup in WTI over, let's say, the last couple of weeks uh, was in, in part because, um, you know, concern over what, what might happen out, out of an ongoing battle or a widening battle between Iran and Israel. And I think the world is waiting right now to see what Israel does in response to the, that latest uh, drone attack. Um, th there isn't enough spare capacity on the planet to make up for something major. But at the moment, the market seems to be downplaying the risk of it. Okay. So as uh, the price, though, has been in this trend, uh, up off the lows, back into the mid-80s, how much flexibility does this give the companies that you cover? And I know you recently upgraded Exxon. Is that connected to crude oil price, or is that about the deals they're going through? Walk me through it. Right. So I think that um, really the biggest impact – uh, for me on the upgrade for Exxon was was really on the demand side, not the supply side. Uh, some of the data that's come out of China recently, uh, first quarter GDP uh, in China north of 5%, that's better than people had been expecting. Um, certainly China has sort of articulated that they want 5% or better, but I think the market was pretty skeptical of that. I thought something more like 4.5% was probably more likely, and yet first quarter numbers were, were, were quite impressive. And so why does that matter? It matters because China is really the workhorse for incremental oil demand growth year on year. If China disappoints, it's going to be very difficult for oil demand in aggregate uh, to really drive prices higher. But if China does show up and it seems like they are, then I think that kind of puts some wind in the sails for oil bulls. And that's, that's a big part of my upgrade on Exxon. Okay. And what's possible here? Because right now we're toying with one-year highs. Hasn't quite been able to punch through there. Do we need to get another lift in the commodity price, or is Exxon reasonably disconnected? Can they prove shareholder value without a big lift off in the crude price? Yeah, actually, I think the major players uh, in the oil markets, whether it's, you know, Saudis or Exxon or the ENPs, don't really want oil punching through 100 bucks a barrel, for example. In the short term, it's great. They're going to make money hand over fist. Um, the risk, of course, is that you push oil prices too high and global economies careen into a ditch, and nobody wants that. So I think something in the $80 to $90 a barrel range is high enough that all of these publicly traded companies are going to make a lot of money, uh, drive a lot of cash flow, but not so high that it's putting the economy at risk. Uh, so I, 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 I like this. Um, range we're in uh, for oil companies, and I think it's likely that we persist here. Okay. Uh, hang on with us. I want to talk Chevron in a second, Stuart. Uh, but, Tom, looking at Exxon yeah. with the bullish call, how do you trade it? Um, well, you have to remember this stock's just off all time highs that we hit last Friday. Yeah, so that's a concern. Earnings on the 26th of this month. Uh, so just over uh, about a week and a half here. So that's going to be potential catalyst here. But if you think crude oil is going to continue to stabilize, we've got geopolitical risks here, uh, and maybe uh, attached to those uh, all-time highs and continue to move higher. I got a strategy that takes advantage of it, of a move higher, but then also giving yourself a little bit of duration, a couple months until expiration, uh, in case there's some near-term volatility. So I looked out in the June monthly cycle, uh, so about 66 days to expiration. I just looked at buying a, a simple call vertical, where I'm going to buy the 120 strike call that's at the money, and then against it because maybe the gains aren't above 130, and I want to offset some of the costs on that extrinsic option premium in this. Uh, this trade on the long 120 strike call. Sell the 130 strike call against it. Bullish $10 wide call vertical to the upside. You're paying roughly about a $3.20 debit for that. So there's going to be your risk, $300, $320 per spread. 
on that one with a break even of 123.20 to the upside. That's about 3% above the current share price. So you don't need a monster move, but you're expecting to get to back to those all-time highs that we saw last Friday and continue to move higher, but you don't need it to explode to 150. Got it. All right. Well, hey, uh, Stewart's 135 was yeah. in there. You could definitely profit from that in this yep. trade. Okay, so buying the call spread for 320 bucks. Looking forward to get through at least 123-ish. Uh, Stewart, you've got a hold on Chevron. Uh, will that mm -hmm. turn into a buy once the Hess deal is done, or uh, too many complications with Guyana, or what? So I, I think certainly there's risk. Uh, people aren't sure exactly how Guyana is going to play out. Um, if that gets interrupted, that takes away a lot of the value uh, for Chevron in this acquisition. Um, I think the bigger deal, why I'm less enthusiastic on Chevron, is that Chevron has relatively more exposure to natural gas. I don't really love the prospects for U.S. natural gas at the moment. Prices are weighed down by too much supply. Um, certainly, we do have LNG, and I, I do like the LNG exporters like Chenier Energy. Um, but it only makes up about, you know, call it 10, 15 percent of U.S. supply. The other 85 percent is going to have to make do with, you know, spot prices in country. And they, they aren't they aren't super impressive right now. OK, uh, Oxy, give me the uh, real quick bull case on that one. Is that just sort of a higher beta play in this category still or have they grown out of that reputation? Uh, so they were they were starting to slim themselves down on debt. And then, of course, they made the acquisition for Crown Rock. So they're kind of, it's not as, as sizable as Anadarko was, but they will benefit probably more than most from oil prices remaining $80 plus. Uh, and, uh, you know, we like, we, like that they're, we like their growth in the Permian Basin. We think oil prices are going to remain high enough for long enough that they can re, once again, get their balance sheet back in order uh, post-acquisition. Okay. Thank you, Stuart, very much. Good job. Uh Quick assessments of these, a nice uh, bang, 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 three of them there. All right, uh, Tom, you got a trade in Chevron? Hit me. Yeah, a little bit more conservative based on uh, their neutral rating. I think at $160 price target. So uh, they've got earnings on the 26th also, so that could be a potential catalyst. But this stock uh, still uh, up only 5% this year, down about 8% over the last 12 months. So it's underperformed a lot of the other names in this space, especially its main competitor, Exxon. Um, so I looked at something a little bit more conservative where I can take advantage of the dividend yield. We've got over a 4.1% 4 .4 dividend yield uh, on this stock going into those earnings. So I looked at a covered call strategy where for every 100 shares of stock that I buy, I'm going to sell an out-of-the-money call to the upside against it to offset some of my costs. So in essence, I'm buying the shares at a discount because I sell that upside call. Now, that caps some of my gains uh, also but you do have that ability to roll that short option on a week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis, creating more credits and extending the position. Uh, so for every 100 shares of stock you buy, sell one of the May 17th monthly, the 165 strike call. Uh, you're uh, pay paying basically a debit of about $155.50. So it's about a 1% discount to the current share price in there uh, over the next 31 days. And as I mentioned, you get to roll or adjust that short option as you get closer to expiration in May over the next month. That 4.16% dividend yield creates yield along with selling that out of the money call uh, to the upside, which is about $7 out of the money to the upside. So you've got plenty of room for this thing to move higher. But then also at the same time, if the stock just stays where it is, you can be profitable on it also. All right, thanks Tom for the trades. A Couple ways to get exposure to upside in energy at a measured pace.